أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مدحته القائلون ولا يحسين عماءه العادون ولا يؤدي حقه المجتهدون الذي لا يدركه بعد الهمم ولا يناله غوص الفطن الذي ليس لصفته حد محدود ولا نعت موجود ولا وقت معدود ولا أجل ممدود فطر الخلائق بقدرته ونشر الرياح برحمته ووتد بالسخور ميدان أرضه والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا الممجد بشيرنا المصدق نذيرنا المعيد المصطفى الأمجد محمود الأحمد الذي سمي في السماء بأحمد وفي الأرض بأبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الذين قال عنهم الرسول اللهم إن هؤلاء أهل بيتي وخاصتي وحمتي لحمهم لحمي ودمهم دمي يؤلمني ما يؤلمهم ويحزنني ما يحزنهم أنا حرب لمن حاربهم وسلم لمن سالمهم وعدو لمن عاداهم ومحب لمن أحبهم إنهم مني وأنا منهم فجعل صلواتك وبركاتك ورحمتك وغفرانك ورضوانك علي وعليهم وأذهب عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا واللعنة الدائمة الباقي على أعدائهم ومبغذيهم وغاصب حقوقهم ومنكر فضائلهم ومناقبهم من أول يوم ظلمهم إلى لقاء يوم الدين أما بعد سلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام Felicitations and congratulations on the occasion of the wiladat of our 11th Imam, Imam Al-Hassan Al-Askari, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. Which was celebrated today being the day of the wiladat of the 11th Imam, alayhi salatu wa salam. Born in Medina al Munawwara on 10th of Rabi'u al Akhar, 232 Hijri. Died in Samarra in the year 260 after Hijra, which makes him 28 years old at the time of his death. The period of his imamat was six, a total of six years where he was the imam and 22 years he lived under the wings of his father, Imam Al-Hadi Sarawatullahi wa salamu The period of the life of the 11th imam is an interesting one and his contributions in the preparation of the period of occultation is one of the most important contributions that was made by the 11th Imam alongside his father. The preparation for occultation of the 12th Imam and the notion of this whole concept of occultation was being prophesized by the Holy Prophet himself, by Amir al and by the other Aimma, one after the other. Each one has mentioned the period of Al-Qa'im. Each one has mentioned the arrival of Al-Qa'im. For instance, the Holy Prophet of Islam, Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, talks about the arrival of Al-Qa'im. 
he talks about him being from his own loins. He talks about him being from the uh, womb of, or from the line of Janab Fatima to Zahra. He also mentions that his name will be the name of the Holy Prophet of Islam himself. And the Holy Prophet makes an emphasis by saying that the arrival of this particular Al-Qa'im is a definite and that it will happen even if there was only one day left for this world to end. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring him. You come to Amir al-Mu'mineen, there is a similar tradition in relation to the period of Al-Qa'im. And you come to Imam Hassan and each and every Imam has mentioned this. In the history of the Shias, there was a period of confusion and chaos. A confusion and chaos for something that had never taken place before within the circles of leadership. Something that the Shia community was not used to. Something that the Shia community had never experienced before. Although there was a precedence in Quran in relation to this in history, However, within the history of the Imams, something like this had never happened before. And that concept within the Shia community brought huge division within the Shia community, skepticism within the doctrines of the Shia community, as well as the Shia community remaining in the state of chaos. This was the period after the wafat and the shahadat of our eighth Imam, Imam Ali ibn Musa al-Ridha, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. This Imam of ours is known as Gharibu al because he's the only one who is far away from the rest of the Imam. So if you look at Medina, for example, you have the Holy Prophet of Islam buried in Medina, you have Hazrat Zahra, in Medina, you have Imam Al-Hassan in Medina, Imam Zainul Abidin in Medina, Imam Al-Baqit and Imam Al-Sadiq. All these people are in Medina and they are all mostly within Jannatul Baqir. Then when you come to Iraq, you have Amirul Mu'mineen. In Samarra, you have Imam Al-Hadi and Imam Al-Askari. In Kazimain, you have Imam Al-Kazim. And in Karbala, you have Imam Hussein alayhi salam. So there is only one Imam who is our eighth Imam, who is far away from the rest of the Aima Salam, and that is why they call him Gharibul Ghuraba. They call him Gharibul Ghuraba because he was summoned by Ma'moon uh, against his will and was taken there and was given political power and position by Ma'moon due to his own political aspirations of that particular time. Anyway, this Imam of ours in Tus died and at the time of the death of the eighth Imam, the ninth Imam was only either eight years old or nine years old. This was one of the most difficult periods for the Shia community. The Shia community had not anticipated other than the few who were informed by the eighth imam had not anticipated to be led by someone who was merely a child so it was the first time that the shia community was in the state of turmoil the shia community did not know what was happening and the obviously naturally there was skepticism and valid skepticism on how can a child of nine years lead the community. So we can go back to the Quran, look at the Quran, understand the Quran, and find a precedence. And we have this in Quran and Majid in cases of two prophets. One prophet Isa والسلام, and one in the case of prophet Yahya. وَآتَيْنَاهُ الْحُكْمَ صَبِيعًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about wisdom given to Yahya while he was still a child. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about Isa alayhi salatu wasalam who became a Nabi while he was still in the cradle or he declared his nubuwa while he was still in the cradle. So when he says, 
Atani al Kitab, Allah has given me a book, Wajalani Nabiya, and has made me a prophet, Wajalani Mubarak and Ainama Kuntu, and has made me blessed wherever I am, Wausani Bisalati wa Zakati Madum to Hayya. So you will see that in Quran there is this precedence that we have two prophets who have been mentioned and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them authority and has given them wisdom and nubuwa at that very young age. But for the Shia community, the notion of being led by a very young child who was only nine years old, who was supposed to be not only taking religious or jurisprudential questions, who was not only going to guide people and give clarifications on issues of jurisprudence, but was going to make military decisions, was going to make political decisions, was going to make economic decisions, was going to make decisions which was going to affect the Shia community. So there was a natural skepticism at the age of the ninth Imam alayhi salam. How was this resolved? And all this is happening, by the way, for the preparation of the occultation of the 12th Imam, Hazrat Hujjah salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. So, how was this resolved? A delegation of about 50 people left Tus and came to Medina to meet the ninth Imam alayhi salam. It's a long uh, narration in relation to that, a riwayat which, which says what actually transpired. But one of the criteria of Imam in uh, the Shia school of thought, which is extremely stringent and strict, is that the Imam who is being followed by the Shias has to be the most knowledgeable man of his time, has to be able to resolve issues, has to be creative, cannot think about an answer, has to have an answer, because it is a belief of the Shias that the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt والسلام, are divinely given knowledge by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore the divine knowledge is sufficient enough to respond to any question that comes before them. And this should not be a surprise because within the A'imma alayhi salatu wassalam, one who is known as Abu al-A'imma, Amir al muminin is known as Abu al-A'imma, the father of all the Imams, and he is the one who made a historical claim of Saluni qabla an tafqiduni, ask me before you lose me. So you realize that in the line of Imam, these are the children who have resolved issues, questions, that have eliminated the doubts and skepticism of the people from their minds of their ability to be able to lead. In this case, the ninth Imam alayhi salam, if you remember, we, we talk about this every year, the ninth Imam alayhi salatu was was asked a question with regard to someone who had performed Hajj and had hunted in the state of Hajj and was also in the state of Ihram and what was the response? The response of Imam alayhi salam was so powerful that Yahya ibn Aksam was unable to do anything but acknowledge that he was the true Imam and that Allah knew where he was sending his Imam. Age of nine. So this is the after the adulthood, the first young age in preparation for the period of the occultation is nine. Then the ninth Imam والسلام, passes away after fulfilling his responsibility as the Imam of the time. And when he passes away at an advanced age, he leaves behind a son who is the tenth Imam. This time, the age of the tenth Imam is even younger. He is only six years old at the time of the death of the ninth Imam. Imam Al Hadi is only six years old. And here again now, so at the age of nine, that doubt that people had, that skepticism of the people, that shock that people had in a child being able to lead was removed by the imamat of the ninth Imam alayhi salam. From the, from the period of when he was nine years old, he led the Shia community until he passed away. 
at the age of six, that skepticism had calmed down. Here now, the 10th Imam salam, became an Imam at the age of six. So that shock of the people, that doubt of the people, with regard to the Imam being young, with regard to a child leading a community, with regard to a child making decisions which were not ordinary decisions, but decisions which will give clear guidance to the community, to a direction to the community in areas of politics, in areas of social relevance, in areas of economics, in various areas, we realized that by this time, when the 10th Imam was declared to be the Imam, the community was at peace with the Imamat of the 10th Imam, Imam Al-Hadi, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. When Imam Al-Hadi passes away from this world, we have the period of the 11th Imam alayhi salatu wa salam. As we mentioned, he was born in Medina al Munawwara in 232 after Hijrah and died in 260 after Hijrah, being 28 years old. The period of his imamat was six years. That means he became imam at the age of 22. Previous to him, his father became imam at the age of six. And previous to him, his grandfather became imam at the age of nine. However, his son now is going to become imam at the age of five. So the age is reducing even further. The 12th imam, Hazrat Hujjah, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. The 12th Imam in 260 after Hijrah at the death of the 11th Imam is only five years old. His birth has been kept a secret. People are unaware of his existence. They see him at the funeral of his father, Imam al Askari. He is only five years old. The Shia community is prepared for this age. They had skepticism when he was when the Imam was nine years old, but this Imam proved to them. By the way, Yahya ibn Aksam, who tested the ninth Imam and miserably failed in his test, did not learn a lesson. When it came to the tenth Imam, he, together with Ibn Sikit, two of them went and tested the 10th Imam, and again miserably failed. They asked him various questions. Yahya ibn Aktham wanted to bring back all those things of the past in regard to the Hajj where he was humiliated. But this time, in the time of the 10th Imam, Yahya ibn Aktham had prepared a dozen questions, to him difficult questions, which were resolved by the Imam without a problem whatsoever. Now the community was ready to accept an Imam at the age of five. So our 12th Imam became the Imam at the age of five. How was the community and what was the period of occultation? And prior to the period of occultation is an extremely important period. There is a ruler in Banu Abbas known as Mutawakkil, Mutawakkil al-Abbasi. If we were to compare him to any of the brutal leaders of the Banu Umayya, he is considered to be equal to or worse than Yazid bin Muawiyah of Banu Umayyah. Mutawakkil was one of those people who had enmity against the Ahlul Bayt and open enmity. He was the one who raised the Haram of Imam Hussein alayhi salatu was salam, and he was the one who instructed for a farm to be uh, made in that particular area of the Haram of Imam alayhi salam and he failed. Anyway, it's important for us to realize what this period was during the time of the 11th Imam, Imam Hassan al-Askari salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. So A, there was an issue of hostility. Anyone who expressed or showed any love towards the Ahlul Bayt salam, had a problem, was persecuted. Anyone who expressed any kind of love towards the Ahlul Bayt salam, 
was taken to task. So there was fear. Here, the 10th Imam and the 11th Imam, both the father and the son, have played a fundamental institutional role of establishing certain things in place to make it easy for the occultation of the 12th Imam Ali Salatu Salam. For example, one of the most important things was to keep the information of the Holy Prophet of Islam and other Imams flowing to the Shia community with regard to al qaim So for example, the Holy Prophet of Islam has mentioned that al qaim will come. That message had to flow from that time onwards to all periods. But when things are hostile, it becomes even more difficult to pass this message on. So the first responsibility of our Imari, particularly the 10th and the 11th Imam, was to make sure that the flow of information with regard to Al-Qa'im remained continuous. And there was a continuous flow. Two, interestingly, for the preparation of the... Uh, occultation of the 12th Imam. If you will read history, you will realize that both 10th Imam and 11th Imam became less accessible to people. In fact, the 11th Imam used to, we have Ribayat, he used to meet people behind a veil at some point, not wanting to show them his face. You wonder why until you begin to realize that preparation for the occultation of al qaim was one of the most important lessons and important institutions that they wanted to set for the shias to come so the first was to to keep the information or the flow of information continuous number two was to make them inaccessible when i say inaccessible not totally inaccessible However, it became uh, increasingly difficult to meet the 10th Imam. Whenever the 10th Imam was called, he would either send someone or he would have someone who he appointed to represent him. 11th Imam used to meet people in his house, sometimes was unable to meet the people, or sometimes he met the people in his own house, but behind the veil. And he, he did not show his face to the people. The third thing that they did was establishing of the institution of Wakala, both the 10th and the 11th Imam. During this period of 22 years under his father, the 11th Imam, and six years during the period of his Imam, this was one of the most important roles he had played in making sure that the institution of agency and Wakala was established firmly for people to be able to question or to be able to resolve issues in absence of the 12th Imam Hazrat Hujjah Salawatullahi wa Salamu Alayhi. So you will see that these, when it came to collection of monetary dues, homes, the 10th Imam Alayhi Salam established this institute of wakalat. He appointed wakil, he appointed agents to represent him, whether it was for the collection of the monetary dues or the religious dues of the people, or it was to do with a question and Imam's response to that question. It started at that particular time during the 9th, 10th and the 11th Imam, in most more uh, so in the 10th and the 11th Imam's time, and the 11th Imam's time, it became a normal system for people to meet the Imam by writing a letter to him. So when you look at the whole issue, you will see that Imam, 11th Imam is playing a very important role during the six years of his Imamat in keeping the evil away, in making sure that the 12th Imam's birth is hidden away from the people, and also to continuously make sure that the institution of wakalat of the aima is uh, working in the best possible manner for the period of the occultation of the 12th Imam. So by the period of Ghibatek Sughra and the disappearance of the 12th Imam, 
or the occultation of the 12th Imam, the Shia community was ready to not have their Imam in front of them and to also be able to lead the community in the absence of the Imam physically in front of them. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. Now, having said this, this, these are the contributions of the 10th and 11th Imam alayhi wa salatu wa salam. Let me share with you one hadith of the 11th Imam. And the timing of this hadith, uh, knowing that the period of mutawakkil was, had just passed, knowing that the Shias remained in the state or was in a state of, of an environment which was hostile towards them. So Imam alayhi salam gives this particular hadith. And in this hadith, he mentions five things to make sure that three of the most important principles of the Shia Isna Ashari community remain alive. We may have heard this hadith many a times, but let me share with you this hadith again of the 11th Imam. He says there are five signs of a mu'min. 11th Imam says, Alamatul Mu'min Khamsa. There are five signs of a mu'min. The first sign of a mu'min is that a mu'min prays 51 raka'ah of salat daily. Ahada wa khamsa raka'ah. 51 raka'at of prayers daily. That is 17 raka'at, which is an obligatory prayer. And then you have 24, which is nawafil of the 17, so 2 before Fajr, 8 before Dhuhr, 8 before Asr, 3, sorry, 4 after Maghrib, and 2 after Isha. On top of that, there is 11 raka'ah of Salat of Tahajjud, which makes it 51 raka'ah. I will expound on this in a minute. So the first sign of a mu'min is that a mu'min prays 50 raka'ah of Salat. The second sign of the mu'min is Ziyaratul Arba'een. Imam mentions one ziyarat only. There are so many ziyarat out there, but Imam is mentioning one particular ziyarat. It could be waritha, it could be any other ziyarat, but here Imam is mentioning one ziyarat known as the ziyarat of Arba'in. Again, I will expound on this in a minute. The third one is at-takhattum bil yameen. Imam says, and this is to do with the identity of the Shia. He says, that amongst the signs of a mu'min is that they wear a ring on their right hand. This is the third sign of a mu'min. The fourth sign of a mu'min is prostration on the ground. When we say on the ground, we are talking about the dust. So you can do it on more or anything, but what Imam is talking about is dust. He is, when, when you take a more from Karbala, obviously it is even more. But he is talking about one of the signs of a mu'min is that he will perform his prostration on the ground. And the fifth sign of a mu'min is that he will recite or she will recite Bismillah loudly in every salat. So Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim will always be recited loudly. What is Imam alayhi salam trying to tell us? The hadith is there. We have heard it many a times. Signs of a mu'min is 51 rak'ah salah. What is this 51 rak'ah salah? In the obligatory prayer, you have, you, there is no choice that you and I have. Whether we are happy with Allah or we are unhappy with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether we are happy with the qada and qadr or we are not happy with the qada and qadr. Whether a calamity befalls us or happiness overwhelms us. It makes no difference whatsoever. 17 rak'ah of salat have to be prayed. Nawafil is a level. 
So when we talk about level, we we say that that you reach a point in your life when you are praying your salat and you feel that you are more energized for whatever reason. You are more energized to pray your salat. Use that energy to pray the nawafil. That's what Imam Ali Salat is saying. Then comes the tahajjud. This is what I have always said. Why is there so much importance if in the Salat of Tahajjud, the 11 rakats of Salat of Tahajjud, why is there so much importance? We do it on our own. It is done in the middle of the night. It is done when the world is asleep. It is done in secrecy. When you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are alone, why so much emphasis on this? In this, after 10 rak'ah, there is one rak'ah known as Salat of Witr. In this Salat of Witr, you and I are supposed to raise our hands and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the prayer in there is to pray for 40 people. And this is what the purpose of the entire creation is. In the middle of the night, in your discussions and communication with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no one else, you are bringing 40 people that you are thinking of. Reminding yourself that you are now praying for these people, whether they are dead or alive, and you want to be able to to serve or to do something for them. So this Salat of Tahajjud is actually giving you and I the opportunity to grow spiritually, to be able to think about these 40 people, to be able to see the purpose of my entire creation with regard to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. So Imam says 51 rak'ah of prayers a sign of a mu'min meaning that a mu'min will not sleep unless he thinks of the makhluk of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He will not wake up until he thinks of the makhluk of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the first aspect of this particular is the importance in the period of ghaybat of the 12th Imam. It will be extremely important to understand the importance of brotherhood, the importance of the purpose of creation, it will be very important to make sure that through this Salat, we keep the madhab of the Ahlul Bayt and the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt والسلام, alive. Two is inspiration, the ziyarat of Arba'in. Had it not been for Hussein ibn Ali, this is, this is an acknowledgement. Had it not been for Hussein ibn Ali, had it not been for Karbala, had it not been for the sacrifices of Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam, there would not be the Islam as it stands today. That Imam says cannot be forgotten, and inspiration must be drawn from the life of Imam alayhi salatu wasalam by the recitation of the ziyarat. Imam mentions Arba'in as one ziyarat. It does not mean only Arba'in. It means the remembrance of Aba Abdullah al Hussein, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. So the prayer is laying emphasis, the, the 51 rak'ah prayers is laying emphasis on the importance of salat and through salat of the makhluk of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's service uh, during the ghaybat of the 12th Imam. During the ghaybat of the 12th Imam, this is what the 11th Imam is telling us. During the ghaybat of the 12th Imam, we must draw inspiration from Abu Abdullah al Hussein. And third important thing, or the three other things, are to make sure that we maintain our identity and keep our identity all the time. And that identity is wearing of the ring on the right hand side, that identity is prostration on the ground. And that identity is to say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim loudly. 
so that the followers of the Ahlul Bayt والسلام, are distinctly understood through their characters of serving people, through their character of not forgetting the, the worship and the Salat, through their character of wanting to serve the makhluk of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and upholding the values as given to us by Aba Abdullah al Hussein salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. So you see the preparation of the occultation by the 12th Imam, although it was not only the, the ziyarat or the, the, the establishment of the institution of wakalat or agency, it was also through these ahadith to keep the message of Hussein ibn Ali alive, to, to, to bring that uh, characteristic of the Ahlul Bayt and, and instill upon us to have a reflection of that characteristics in our lives. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, to in the name of the 11th Imam alayhi salatu wasalam to give you and I the tawfiq to be able to understand our madhab, our religion, our responsibility better. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten the reappearance of the 12th Imam alayhi salam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon his reappearance to give you and I the tawfiq to join the Ansar in the awan of Imam alayhi salatu wasalam. May I request you to join me in reciting three loud salawats in the name of Imam Al Hassan Al Askari, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. <laughs> Allah. <laughs>